So welcome everyone, thanks for coming. My name is Dave Rolski and I'm going to uh, make your technical hiring process suck at least 20% less. It's a big promise, but we'll, we'll see if I can follow through. So I do wanna emphasize I work at Active State. Uh, I enjoy working at Active State. So all of these opinions are mine alone. That said, I am in a hiring capacity there and I've been doing hiring and trying to apply my own advice to the hiring as much as possible. So, but yeah, no, nonetheless, this is not like an active state sponsored talk. This is, this is me, my opinions. So this all started when I was looking for a job about a year and a half ago. And I felt kind of like this, you know, it was a little sad looking for a job. It's stressful and I was sad to leave my old job. And then I started applying for jobs and I felt a bit more like this. Um, now maybe the table flip is an overstatement because it was more of a strong, constant irritation than an actual table flipping rage. But nonetheless, the process was frustrating. So why? There are, there are a number of reasons. So a lack of basic courtesy was a big one. Uh, a lot of unprepared interviewers, also prepared interviewers, but it was just a weird mix. Some pointless questions that I did not understand why anybody would bother asking. And just general wasted time. Very annoying, not that much skill evaluation. And of course, it was really, really slow. Just everybody's slow. Um, this is just a, co a constant problem in hiring in general. It seems to be a problem in technical hiring. So ultimately, I kind of took a job in spite of the hiring process that I'd been through rather than because of it. Um, and so I think it can be less terrible. So that, that's my pitch today, less terrible. So why bother? Besides all the things that I just listed, what, what's the advantage if you're on the hiring side? Well, you're wasting your own time. You know, I, I feel like a lot of the hiring process can be very wasteful of your time. And hiring is time intensive no matter what. So if you're wasting your time, that's not good. Of course, false positives are really expensive. So if your process isn't actually good at finding people who will work, that's not so great. False negatives or missed opportunities, that's not great either. Bad hiring turns candidates off so you could have a process where somebody was initially excited to work for your company, and then if your process is really bad, they might, at the end of it, when you make an offer, say, you know what, no thanks. If this is how you do hiring, then I don't want to work for you. And really, I would say hiring is the most important thing that you're doing when you're doing it, because the amount, you know, the work you do is very important, but when you hire someone else, that's like a multiplier. So if you're hiring people, it's really kind of a big deal that you get the best people you can get and waste as little time as possible. So how can you start? So how do you start by making your, to make your process better? So step one is you gotta figure out what it is that you want. So I, I feel like a lot of places don't actually start with this step, which is really weird to me. So you should have some sort of evaluation criteria. So what sort of criteria would you put in there? Is the cursor, yeah, okay. Like trying to scroll something on my screen. So the first thing, of course, is you're gonna have some sort of technical skills, right? If you're hiring for technical hiring. If there's anything specific, make sure to cover these somehow in your hiring process to make sure that people have them. Um, you might want them to have knowledge about your domain. Maybe, maybe not. Depends on what you're doing, what you need. You probably want somebody with good communication skills. You know, they need to be able to collaborate effectively with other people on the team, other technical staff. <clears throat> In most places, they're probably gonna also need to be able to communicate effectively with non-technical staff. Uh, you probably want them to have some level of writing and organization skills because a lot of what we do as developers involves writing, writing comments, writing docs, writing commit messages. How many of you were, have worked with somebody whose commit message was fixed a bug? And that's really annoying when you're trying to figure out what happened. So trying to figure out if people have these skills is important. And we'll come back to all of this again later. Another important thing is everybody should agree on what's important. So everybody involved in the hiring process before you start doing hiring, or certainly before you start reviewing resumes and interviewing people, and really before you write the job posting, you should agree on this, okay? So everybody needs to agree that these are the things that I think are important. Uh, don't just assume that everybody involved is on the same page as you, because you know what they say about assuming. So you really should meet with people, discuss with the other folks involved with the hiring, 
here's the things we think are important, do you agree? And if they don't, you know, have a discussion. They'll, they'll probably have good reasons why they think some other thing is or isn't important. But ultimately, you need to come to agreement on this. So that feeds into the, the job posting. So I think it's really important that you put really clear requirements and benefits, uh, but be very careful about what's a required skill. I see places just like with these long laundry lists of required skills. First of all, most people don't have like every single specific thing you might imagine. Um, and my theory is that good people are gonna learn new technologies quickly. So if it's like, oh, we really need somebody who knows about message queues. But if you're already using message queues and you have people who know this internally, or you, know, you don't need to hire somebody else who knows this to get, just to get them to do work, right? They can come in, you can teach them about it. So I, I really caution people against putting too many requirements. What I'd like to do is just put stuff in the optional section is nice to have, because of course sometimes there's lots of things that we're using that would be great if they could come on board and know already, but it's not absolutely necessary. Now sometimes I would point out you need to hire somebody to teach you something. So maybe nobody on the team knows it. You really want to get into, I don't know, using AWS and you have an open position. Well, it would make a lot of sense to actually hire somebody with AWS expertise at that point, because then they'll come in and teach you something. But that's a, that's a, not as common case. It can't, be, it can't explain all these job postings I see with the laundry list of things they need. Um, another thing to really think about is do they need a degree? I see all these positions that want a comp sci degree. I don't understand this. I don't have a comp sci degree myself and I'm amazingly awesome. So I can't imagine why that would be required. Uh, in all seriousness, I don't think it's really necessary to have a comp sci degree to work in this industry, especially if somebody has some sort of experience, right? If somebody can point to GitHub or something and was like, look, I wrote a bunch of code, isn't that good enough to figure out whether they can write a bunch of code? Uh, if it's not, I don't know exactly what you're hiring for. Uh, the other things that should go in the job posting have a very clear description of the work. This helps people filter themselves for things that they don't wanna do. So things to mention are like the size of the team that they'll be on, um, whether you're doing new code, you know, greenfield work, old code, both, uh, what technologies you're using, just cause that's a way to get people excited potentially. And also if somebody's like, I don't know, I hate whatever, PHP, just to pick a language totally at random. Um, and they just can't imagine working on that, then you don't want them to apply because you know it's a waste of their time, waste of your time. So the more detail you can put about what you do, how your team works, the better. Uh, also put about like what types of interactions they'll have with non-technical folks. Some developers probably don't want to deal with customers and if that's a big part of the job, maybe make sure to mention that. And really anything else you can mention that you think is of interest, like talk about your development workflow. Do you use GitHub and pull requests and stuff like that? Do you do pair programming? Whatever things you do, put it in there because it will get the right people excited and it will keep the wrong people away. And by wrong, I don't mean that they're bad, just that they wouldn't be a good fit for your particular environment. So again, this is about saving everybody some time. And of course, one of the most important things is to mention whether you allow remote employees. Um, I feel like that's a no-brainer to say, but you know, I don't know. Job postings are terrible, so I'm gonna say the no-brainer things. I strongly believe in putting a salary range, but if you go to Active State and see the positions that have been posted for my team, you'll notice that there's no salary range. So I've lost this battle so far at Active State, but I'm gonna bring it up every damn time we have a job posting. Uh, I may or may not ever win, but at least I'll, you know, I'll fight the good fight. I really think you should include a salary range. In this industry, especially with remote jobs, the salary ranges are very wide and it's not always clear what the expectation is. Like if I live in Minnesota, are they gonna pay me a Minnesota rate even though the company is based somewhere more expensive? I don't know. Having some sense of that is very helpful because again, this, this prevents you from wasting time. If salary is like the last thing that gets discussed as part of a negotiation, and so you spent, I don't know, 10, 15 person hours interviewing and reviewing their code and whatever you've been doing, and then they get to the end and you just can't agree on salary, why, how does that possibly make sense? That's a terrible use of everyone's time. So I, re I really want to, Encourage everybody else to do this, even though I can't quite make it happen yet for me. I won the battle at my last company, but I haven't won it yet here. 
So, what next? Pre-interview screening. Remember the criteria you, you set up in the beginning, the things you think are important. The technology knowledge that you want them to have, the communication skills, all of that sort of stuff. Try to, you know, do as much of that screening as you can early uh, by resume or I'll talk about other ways to do it, just as much as possible. But again, remember every step you're applying those criteria you came up with. Send the responses quickly and actually send some damn responses. The number of places that don't even send an automated rejection when you, when you, like, when you click the reject button in their, their candidate software, I just, it blows my mind. And if you don't have candidate software and have to do it by hand, I don't care, you need to do it anyway. It's just like basic courtesy to tell somebody thanks but no thanks. And really, this should be automated so it's easy. If it's, if it's too hard, then I don't know, you have some sort of problem. Um, and you know, all, the other thing you should do is send a thank you immediately after they reply. Again, a, a, any half competent system will let you automate this. You should just say, thanks for your application, we'll get back to you in the near future. Just so that they know it actually went through when they clicked the button or sent the email. Um, and try to move on to the next steps as quickly as possible. So I really like trying to do some sort of technical pre-screening. Uh, and just the goal is to find out whether they have any, like some level of coding skill. Um, and you can't really get a sense of that without having them do some sort of coding, right? You can't figure out if somebody can code by asking them questions. You figure out if somebody can code by having them write some code and looking at it. Excuse me. So that all said, you can't make them do real work. That's not okay. If it's, if it's something you need done for your company, you have to pay them if they're gonna do it. But that has its, a whole can of worms where a lot of people have contracts that forbid moonlighting. So, you know, it's tricky. So then you can, uh, you can give them a shorter kind of test assignment, something that just takes a couple hours that's a little more reasonable. Um, Something like that. So it's really important to find some way to evaluate their actual ability to do the job. And the best way to do that is to look at, at code. So there's two, two ways that I've done this. Uh, homework is the obvious one. So I try to, for all the homeworks that I've designed for different jobs, try to make sure it, it does not take more than three hours to complete. That's not as little as I'd like, but I also feel like to have any sort of substantial amount of code that's not just 10 lines needs to take a little time. I always do the homework myself. I always give it to other people on the team and make them do it and have them report how long it took. And if it takes them three hours, it's too long. Because if it takes you or somebody who's like intimately involved with the process three hours to do the assignment that you want to hand to a total stranger, then it's going to take the total stranger four, five, six hours. So it should be taking your team maybe one and a half to two hours to do it. If, otherwise, it's too long. And when we were hiring an active state, we came up with a homework problem and I did it and it took me like two and a half hours. And I was like, yeah, there's no way. I, I came up with this and it took me two and a half hours to do it. It's going to take other people quite a bit longer. So we just cut it down and made it simpler. And when I talked to people, it seemed okay. They were taking maybe three, some were taking more. The, the problem is you tell people don't take more than three hours and they get it done in two hours and then they spend the next four hours polishing it. I don't know, it's, it's tough. I don't wanna abuse their time, but I wanna see some of their real code. Of course, the other thing you can do is accept code samples. So I didn't do this in the past, but for this current job, we decided to do it. And I think it worked out quite well. We said to people, when we sent them this email about doing the homework, like here's the homework assignment, here's what we want you to do, and then in big bold, there's a sentence. However, you can ask for an exemption if you can point us at some code that we can look at, and we basically said it has to be something reasonably self-contained, a small app or a library, not like a 50,000 line or 500,000 line, you know, giant monster server thing or Flip side, we don't want to look at a PR you sent to somebody else's project. It had to be something that you created mostly yourself, that you were kind of the primary owner of, and was, you know, a few thousand lines of code, not tens of thousands, because we can't, you know, on the wasting time front, we cannot look through 10 people submitting a 50,000 line project. That's just not reasonable. The homework assignment that we gave people typically came back at anywhere from I would guess like 300 to 800 lines, maybe a thousand. So, you know, I'm willing to look at a few thousand lines of code, but I can't do too much more. You guys, 
when you're in doing your homework, or sorry, when you're doing your hiring process decisions, this is a discussion to have. Do you want to make everyone do the homework? In some ways, it's a little fairer uh, in that everybody has to do the same thing. You evaluate them all the same way. Flip side, you let them submit something they've already done. You're saving everybody some time, and that's a nice thing too. Be prepared to actually evaluate the homework. So, of course, we have our evaluation criteria overall, but for the homework, we can probably get much more specific. And if you follow this link, uh, you'll see the thing that we sent out for our hiring at ActiveSeat, and it has in the repo that we send you that has the assignment, there's also an evaluation.md. And it has all the questions that we ask ourselves when we review the homework. Uh, big hint, if your code doesn't pass, the, you know, get the right answers to these questions, which should be obvious, because it's like, does the code do this? Like, handle this error case? Then you're probably not going to move on in our process, yet I'm not sure everybody actually read through the evaluation. Anyway, you ha should have some sort of very clear evaluation. So again, if you're having multiple people review the homework, and you probably need to have at least two, um, you should agree on what's important and what's not important. And of course, you'll still disagree on your evaluations and then you talk about it. The homework instructions should be very detailed. It's really easy when you write these to have ideas in your head that do not get translated onto paper or, well, not paper. What am I saying? How are, yes, and then you send it by carrier pigeon. It's really easy to have ideas in your head that don't get translated into the README and the GitHub repo. And so you really have to be careful to make sure this is very detailed. This is another reason to have people do it internally in your company. Ideally, people who weren't involved in the formulation of the homework at least have one person do it. So it's clear that your instructions make sense and don't leave a lot of ambiguity. Because what happens is if you don't cover something in the instructions, you'll get back varying different ways of doing it, you know, handling some error case or, you know, do I need to check for this or that? You'll get this back in the homework and it's not clear, did somebody make a mistake if they didn't do something that you didn't ask for? Did you know, the person who did it, did they do better? It's not clear because following instructions, that's a good thing. You told them not to spend more than three hours. So again, just make sure the, the homework is very detailed. Cover just what you want them to do, but also if there are things that they don't need to do. For example, in the active state example, uh, we explicitly say there, there's a circular dependency case that could happen in theory. We say you don't need to check for it because we don't want people to just spend more time on things we decide we're okay. Kind of already covered this, that the samples have to be substantial. Um, uh, yeah, this, this always happens. I do something that's on five slides ahead. So we'll skip this. And yeah, I already covered this. Should everyone do the homework? It's up to you. Uh, this, is, this is your technical hiring process. You're going to make it better one way or another. It's up to you to decide. All right. So how to do interviews. So here's the first thing you should do is actually make a list of questions. Uh, I've had interviews with people where it was quite obvious that they had not actually planned in ahead in advance what to ask me. And I found this very off-putting. Um, it, it's very, keep in mind people are nervous. Normal people, I don't get that nervous, but like sane normal people actually get nervous in interviews. And when you're clearly unprepared and don't know what you're doing, you're really freaking the candidate out. So don't do that. Also, you're wasting valuable time where you could be getting to know this person and learn more about them and learn whether they are suitable for what you wanna hire them for. So make a list of questions in advance. For every question that you put on the list, there should be a reason why you're asking it. And that reason cannot be because I, oh, it seems interesting to me. No, tie it back to your evaluation criteria. What are the things you wanna learn about the person? What do they need to demonstrate in order to be a good candidate? And every question on your list, you should be able to tie back to one or more of those criteria. Um, now, uh, a perfectly valid reason to ask a question is because it's a really easy warm-up question that hopefully will help the candidate relax. So that's a valid reason too, but you don't just ask things for no reason whatsoever or because somebody asked them to you at an interview in the past. For example, what's your greatest strength and weakness? Ugh. <clears throat> yeah, terrible question. And then, of course, the flip side is for every criterion that you care about, 
you should have some questions that cover it, or you should be covering it somewhere in the hiring process. If not during the, this technical interview, then maybe it's something that comes up during the homework or some other stage. But you gotta make sure that if you decide something is important that you have a way to evaluate that. Be prepared. Read the forking resume. I, I have had interviews where people say, oh, I didn't look at your resume. I'm like, oh, thanks, that really makes me feel good. It, 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 this seems like the very minimum. I'm not saying read it in detail, top to bottom, every little thing, but you know, at least know some of the technologies they've worked on, where they last worked. You don't need to memorize their entire job history, but you should at least know where they are now or what their last position was. You know, just, and hell, if you haven't read it, don't tell them you haven't read it. At least fake it for, oh man. Anyway, the other thing, coordinate the process in advance. So if you're having multiple interviews, and I'll get into whether, you should, whether I think you should do that later, but just be real coordinated. So if you have multiple people, if it's a group interview, which is really common, and I think it's just fine, figure out who's gonna ask the questions. Will just one person ask all the questions? Are you gonna kind of trade off on every question? Maybe one person asks like the general questions, the other does some technical stuff, whatever. Doesn't, this doesn't matter as much as that you have something coordinated in advance and that during the interview you're not looking at each other and going, uh, who's supposed to talk next? Just be organized. Again, you're trying to make this process as not painless, it'll never be painless, but make it less painful for the candidate. Let them be their best self by not making them more nervous than you have to make them. When you are uncoordinated and it doesn't seem like you know what you're doing, you're making them more nervous. Figure out what types of questions you'll ask, what types of questions you won't ask, what you're looking for, all this sort of stuff. And also make sure, it's very important, that you allocate time for the candidate to ask their own questions. Um, you can do it at the end, you could say ask me a question whenever you want, you could do both. Just make sure that you have some time for that slotted. So like I said, I'm, I think group interviews are fine as long as you're very organized. The way we typically, well I've done a couple different things. I've done things where like just one person asks all the questions and we, I tell the candidate up front, you know, I'm gonna do all the talking, the other people are here to, just to listen. Uh, I might ask them to chime in on your questions, something like that. I've also done things where we traded off explicitly, like we had, a, we had our list of questions, remember we've made a list of questions, and we had a point in the list where it was like, okay, Sh Sean, you, who was the person I was doing this with, you take over. And it was really clear and organized. So the other thing you should do is have some sort of back channel for chat uh, so that people in the interview, like on your side, can be like, oh, hey, you missed this, or can you ask more about this, or, this is going nowhere, can you find a way to end this gracefully? Uh, all of which are val valid things to discuss privately. So, basic politeness. What, you sh what should you start with at the interview? Uh, not questions, no. You need to start with introductions. There's a company I interviewed with where I realized I was interviewing with one of the co-founders about 30 or 40 minutes into the interview. I, I, I'm not gonna say what company it is, but they might be represented in this room. A, a company that, by the way, I gotta say seems really great in a lot of ways. I, I don't wanna like, say this was a bad company at all. I think I, I would have been very happy to work there. But there's always, there's always things that could be improved. So what I would suggest is that you start the interview with some introductions and everybody should say their name, what their position in the company is, uh, their relationship to this potential hire, like I'd be your manager, or I'd be on the same team as you, or I'm on a different team, just to give them some context, if that's not obvious. How long you've been with the company, again, more context, and if you're remote, tell them where you live, just to give them a sense of that. Just to, again, just to be friendly and polite. You should also tell them about the interview. Tell them what you're gonna do and how it's gonna be structured. So this is the thing I basically read to people at Active Seat. Uh, and I'll read it to you now. It says, our goal is to learn more about you and for you to learn more about us in the position. We will not be asking stumper type techn technical questions, nor are we looking for someone who fits a specific mold. If you have any questions during the interview, please feel free to ask them as they occur to you. We'll also make sure to leave time at the end of the interview for you to ask questions. So just giving them a little bit of prep of how this is gonna go. Doesn't take very long. It just, again, this is kind of, 
trying to put people at ease, be polite, make it easier for them to be their best self. So what sort of things can you learn in an interview? This goes back to the types of questions you might ask and your criterion and all that stuff. Does the candidate want the job? This is a good thing to try to find out because some people will apply to a lot of jobs and maybe they don't actually want them. So try to ask them some questions. I try to find things about, you know, just ask them what appeals to you about this job. And if they don't have any sort of answer, that's a bit of a red flag. You know, and often people say, very normal things like I'm looking for a remote position. Okay, hey, that makes a lot of sense. You'll probably, you know, at least get something out of working here if you're looking for remote or I wanna work with this technology or whatever. Just try to figure out if they want this job and they'll be happy. Can the, can the candidate communicate effectively? So I try to ask them technical questions that aren't like Google look it up type things, but more like let's have a conversation or, tell me about what you like, you know, one of the questions I ask is, um, actually I'll get to that in the next slide. You know, just try to make sure that they can communicate both about technical and non-technical topics effectively. This actually is every question, right? Like if I ask you what, what are you interested in uh, about this job? What interests you for this job? And they can't formulate a coherent answer just like I was unable to formulate a coherent sentence a, a second ago then don't hire them. Don't hire me because clearly I can't communicate. So really just this is something I think is really important. Do they care about technical stuff but not too much? So one of the questions I ask is what's your, you know, what languages have you used? Or you know, I say, okay, I see in your resume you've done JavaScript, Perl, Python, and Go. Anything else you want to mention? Okay, what's your, pick one that's your favorite. And then I ask them to tell me why and then I ask them to tell me what they don't like about it. Because I want them to have some sort of interest in technology, like, you know, I really enjoy using Go because it compiles quickly and it's really easy to deploy and it's got built-in Go format and that's all re really nice. And so they have some sort of opinion. I don't actually care what the opinion is. I just want them to have an opinion. I want them to care about their work. But if they're like, I use Go because it is the greatest language in the world and all others are terrible, that's the too much. You don't want that person on your team because they're gonna drive everybody crazy. So, you know, do they care, but not too much. What's important to them? If they say, I love pair programming and I have to do it all the time, and your team doesn't really like to do pair programming, then actually I would tell, I would say, hey, you know, I'm really glad you brought that up. We don't really do that and I don't see that changing. So I don't know if this is a good fit for you. Is it really such an important thing? Because I want to give them an out. And, you know, if they say, yeah, this is crucial to me, and I say, thanks for your time. You know, I, I wish you the best of luck in finding a job where you can do a lot of pair programming. Um, so, you know, try to figure out if there's things that are really crucial to them that you can't provide. Conversely, if you can provide them, make sure they know that because that'll make them more excited to take the job. What reservations do they have? Again, this is a chance to address concerns or find out if they're like, oh, I'm really concerned about like remote. Like I wanna do video chats all the time, but your team is all about Slack and email. Again, this is, this is an opportunity to say, maybe this isn't the best fit for you. And that's okay, they, they, they haven't done anything wrong, you haven't done anything wrong. Again, save time. Don't have them find out two weeks after they start that this is a terrible position. Another thing I like is see what questions they ask me. This gets back to do they care about stuff? Do they care about technical stuff? Do they care about their work environment and their coworkers and stuff like that? If they have no questions, that's kind of a red flag. I just wanna see some sort of interest. So some of the specific questions I ask. I uh, mentioned this, what appeals to you about this position? What are the most important things for you in a position? What reservations do you have? I'm moving the mouse around on the other screen again. It's really hard because the scroll bar is on the right and the other screen is on the right. I mentioned the programming language one. What is one of the hardest technical problems you've solved just to get a sense of can they explain a hard technical problem? And, and this is especially good because often they're explaining something I don't understand very well. I had a candidate who worked on some satellite stuff. Uh, I don't know anything about programming for satellites and sending them commands to move around in orbit, but he explained it in a way that made sense and it was interesting and he was engaged and he, he was able to communicate that clearly to the rest of us and I thought that was a really good thing. Um, tell us about one of the dirtiest tax you've ever implemented. How would you go back and fix it? Again, just what's their insight into their own work, their own process? Describe what you think an ideal development workflow would look like. Again, I want them to compare, 
care about how this works. I also want to find out if they want us to do, you know, they want to do X and I don't know, they want to do waterfall and we're doing agile or vice versa. And they just think it's got to be waterfall. Good to know. Uh, another type of question that I think is really good, and actually one of the companies I interviewed with uh, asked me a great one. I was really impressed. This is just like a kind of unfolding technical question where you start with kind of the simplest version and then you just make it harder and harder. And the goal is to kind of like push their boundaries a little and have a conversation. Really, this should be a very conversational thing. So, you know, start with like, let's sketch out a design for this thing. And I'm going to give you like the simple version and I'm going to make it harder as we go. And now it's very important that you be prepared to answer their questions because if they're like, well, can I, what's our budget or, you know, can I run this across multiple data centers or whatever? And you say, oh, I don't know, then this isn't going to go very well. So be prepared to answer their questions, make something up on the spot if you need to, but at least have some sense of, of where this is going to go. So you can do something like, you know, build a web service, how would you build like a really simple web service? And they answer that. And you say, okay, what if we wanted to operate across multiple data centers? How do you handle updates from those data centers all, all, all at once? What if, what if it's a batch system that dies six hours into a 12 hour process? Just different ways to kind of push their knowledge, push them to come up with new ideas. The goal isn't to find out that they know everything in the world. That's not the expectation. Again, it's really, can you have a conversation with them about a technical challenge? Because this is exactly what you do at work all the time, right? You're, the, the product team is like, we need to build this set of features. And then, you know, the engineering team says, well, okay, product, do you want to do X, Y, and Z? What about this? What's the, you know, requirements for requests per second and so on. And then you also have this conversation internally. Well, we could build it using a message queue. Well, what if the messages get lost? What if they get delivered more than once? These are the kinds of conversations you need to be able to engage in to be effective in this field. So uh, I think culture fit is really bullshit. And I hate this term. I do think it kind of gets at something that's important, but it's, just, it's much too nebulous. So what I really think you need to focus on is company values. You know, does this person, uh, will they resonate with whatever your company values, whatever that might be. So one thing I really like about working at Active State is there's a real culture of transparency internally. So we have like monthly meetings where the CEO tells us about financials and sales and all that. And I think that's great, it's really cool. If we were hiring a CFO and they were like, it's very important that we not share this information, that would be an example of what you might lump into culture fit, but I would say is like a conflict of values, right? So that's really important. And then, you know, also how you work as a team. So to get back to the pair programming thing, that's something that, you know, is a very concrete thing that might just be a conflict. So other things that you can talk about that I think are narrower, that are more useful, Things like work-life balance goals. If you're a startup where everyone works crazy hours and they want a sane life, or some people really want to just join some startup where they can work crazy hours, and maybe your company doesn't do that. Um, you know, their preferred communication style. I mentioned that before: chat versus video versus email, and so on. You know, these are all things that I think are valid and could maybe be called culture, but I think culture fit gets used as kind of this broad, nebulous term to just like pick people that you like. Not that you shouldn't like them, but you don't need them to be your friends. So I've, I've heard people say things like, you know, you want to hire somebody who you think you could go out and have a beer with. I'm just like, that's crazy. First of all, I don't drink beer or alcohol. I don't want to have a beer with anyone. Second of all, this isn't really about me. The point is, it's not about somebody who's going to be your best bud for life. You want to hire somebody who you think will work well with the team, and I emphasize the word work, okay? You're hiring them for a job, you're not hiring a friend. If you want to interview potential friends, that's a very interesting idea. Maybe there's a talk in there, but that's not what hiring is about. You want to hire people you think you can get along with at work. Doesn't mean you'd want to hang out with them at, after work. That's okay. I'm remote, I can't hire, hang out with anybody I work with. They all live very far away. So I just want to hire people who I think will do a good job day to day at work, you know. Now there is certainly a, you know, basic communication skills, basic civility, all that, that also is something you'd want in a friend. But the things you want in a friend are I think much more and much more specific than what you need out of your coworkers. I think puzzles are also bullshit. I really hate when people do these puzzle type questions. 
Every question you ask, like I said, it should have a purpose. And it's really hard for me to figure out how brain teasers have a purpose because this is not what you, how many of you have had to figure out why manhole covers are round as part of your day-to-day -day work? Really? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. No. Uh, it's like, this is not your job. Figure out, I don't know, the population of some random, all these stupid questions. I mean, this is not your job. I, I want to see how they think. No. Ask them a technical question. See how they think about something actually relevant to the damn job. I also hate really overly specific, especially technical questions. This is bullshit. If it's something that somebody can look up online, don't ask them. You know, how do, I re how do you reverse a doubly linked list without allocating more memory or something like that? And that's like, literally I could type that into Google and get the answer. So why do I need to hire somebody who knows how to do this? Their ability to memorize algorithms or data structures or APIs is not really a very important part of the job. One of the questions I do ask is when you're stuck on something, what resources do you turn to for help? And if they don't mention things like Google and Stack Overflow, that is kind of a red flag. I need people who can look things up and learn stuff. I don't need the people who've memorized everything. That's totally pointless. Really hate whiteboard coding. It's, there's been a lot written on this. It's, again, it's very unrealistic. You're not testing anything like real work. I think it's really stressful and cruel. Uh, now, I, I do want to note that something like sketching out a system architecture on a whiteboard, that's totally legit. That is actually what you would do in real work, right? So that's fine. But asking them to write actual code is not OK. Pseudocode, diagrams, again, the things you might do in real life, that's fine. Similarly, I'm mostly against live coding, but um, at least it's not a whiteboard, but I feel, still think it can be very stressful and cruel. My one exception is I'd like to do a pairing session with people. On the, if they've done the homework, I do it on their homework, otherwise on whatever they submitted. <clears throat> so it's really important that you pair on something that they're familiar with. You can't just hand them some new thing. That's why I use their homework or their code submission. Uh, it's a good way to see what it's actually like to work with them. And also, it does give you a chance to check that like in something approaching real time, they can do it. Because they could tell you they did the homework in four, three hours, but they actually spent three days on it. I do want to at least see that they can think through something in what I think is an appropriate amount of time. And I think at least doing it on some piece of code that they've already written, and you know, I tell them in advance that this will be part of the process so that they can be prepared for it. This is like the least stressful way I can think of to do this. Try to do fewer interviews if, if possible. Uh, this makes the process quicker. It's less stressful. This is why I like group interviews more than just having, I've done interviews at places where they have me interview with like every person on the team serially. They ask a lot of the same questions. It just seems like a big waste of time. There's always going to be people, though, with less free time who won't participate in all the group interviews, the CTO, the CEO. You're going to need to schedule multiple interviews. That's OK. It's also OK to do like a quick pre-screening. Like we do at ActiveState, our, our recruiter just has a 10-minute conversation that's not technical, just to make sure the person isn't just completely weird or you know, unable to communicate at all or just says, something. I, I don't know. We've never had somebody not get through that, so I don't know what it would take. But I feel like spending 10 minutes on the phone talking, letting the recruiter talk to you, uh, it seems like a good use of everyone's time. Um, you know, post-interview, remember your evaluation criteria. That's where we started with all this. You should be evaluating everybody based on all of this and try to make a decision as quickly as possible. It's, it's tough. I, I, I will say we failed miserably with at ActiveState during our last hiring process. It took way too long. Uh, one of the things we did, we did a postmortem after we had finished, and we're like, how, what are all the changes we can make to save time? Save our time, try to make the process move quickly, or quicker. In particular, can we find ways to screen people out a little earlier? So we're going to do like a short technical screening phone interview that'll take like 15 minutes, see if that screens some people out. We, you know. I'd also encourage you to experiment. See if you can find things that work better. There's never going to be anything perfect. And maybe you'll come up with some system that works better for you that, again, saves people time and is, is just a hopefully less stressful for the candidates. But also, stressful or not, if you reject them earlier, that's actually good for them. If they're applying to a lot of jobs, 
you know, it's a stressful process. Getting a no is actually better than sitting in limbo forever. So at least you've let them move on. They can let it go. And now I will sing this. No, I will not sing. So here's my summary. Be prepared. That's what a lot of this has been about is just be prepared. Don't wing it while you're in the middle of interviewing or hiring people. Agree on your evaluation criteria. This is one of the most important things you can do. Have a conversation before you hire to make sure everybody's on the same page and then reflect this through all the stages of the process, through the job posting, through the interview questions, through whatever technical thing you have them do, whether it's homework or submit a code sample, make sure that everything ties back to what you thought was important in the first place. Don't waste your time. You have a lot of work to do. Right? At least I assume you do. I feel like I have a lot of work to do and I assume most other people do. Don't waste your time. Don't waste their time. You know, it's really not cool to keep people on the hook for six or seven or eight weeks and not give them any feedback. Reject them sooner. Ideally try to hire them sooner. It's so hard, but try to make it quicker if you can. And the best thing you can try to do is suck at least 20% less. Thank you. So we have nine minutes by my clock for questions. Yes. Um, I have a question concerning the, the uh, technical part of the, the free screening. Mm -hmm. how, how do you feel about coding tests that are automatically scored using that? So the question was uh, for the pre screening, how do I feel about coding tests that are automatically scored? I've never, I've never really looked at them. My inclination is to think they'd have to be terrible. It's hard for me to. I guess, okay, so what I could imagine in theory is if the way it worked was you were asked a question and the, qu the answer was code and that code was executed and tested against like a test suite or something, that could work, which is essentially what we do with our homework. We say, you know, your code needs to do this and produce this output and then when I, run, I wrote a tester program that I feed their command line program into, it executes it and looks at the output. That seems fine. Do you have a? No, just a question. So, do you share the tests with the candidate? Or okay. do you wait to see what tests they also come up well, with? Well, let me finish answering her question, and then I will answer that because that's also a good one. So, yeah, my, my thinking is that unless the coding test that's automated is really running the code, it's hard to see how it could be good because. Otherwise, you're essentially going to get one of those things where it's like a non-technical person, like all these horror stories we hear about the Google recruiters asking questions where like the person's like an expert in file systems and they give a really detailed answer and the recruiter's like, no, that's wrong. You were supposed to say inode. And it's like, I, it's hard to see how it would be different. So I could imagine in theory it being good. When I said automatically scored, like they have like a bunch of different inputs mm -hmm. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, I mean, I think that could potentially be okay. I'd really want to dig into it more deeply before I'd use it, but it does, I won't say it's automatically awful. <laughs> uh, I do, th however, think there is, I, I guess with that, I'd want it to be something quick, like maybe a 20 or 30 minute thing that we have candidates do relatively early on in the process, again, to try to screen people out earlier. I still want to see I still want to see substantial code they've written because the other thing besides that we look for when we review homework, besides just is it correct, is stylistically how is it? Like is it well organized? You know, and there's lots of ways to organize code and we get lots of different submissions that, you know, organize it in different ways, that's okay, but it can also be very disorganized. And that's something I don't, you know, I don't want to hire somebody who's going to come in and make a mess. So seeing code that's Again, a couple hundred lines where they had to divide it into at least a couple packages and subroutines and stuff, I think is important. And I can't imagine with those coding tests that that's what they're producing. They're, they're normally like, um, so Codility is one of the ones. I think yeah. they like algorithms, data structures. Oh, okay. Yeah, and see that, that, if it's algorithms and data structures, I'll also be concerned that it's just testing like how much you remember from your comp sci degree, which you may or may not have. So, I don't know. I'm skeptical. Color me skeptical. So you had a question, David. Yeah, I was just curious if you, um, in a situation where a homework might, where you might have created tests for the homework, do you share that test suite? 
or do you wait to see what tests the person also writes on their side? So the test, yeah, so the question is, do we show the test suite we have with people doing the homework? We, we haven't. The, the test suite is like a functional test suite that just runs your program for this particular thing, looks at the output, which the output is supposed to be a, a JSON, so it's really easy to just slurp it all up and parse it and make sure it matches what we expect. We, we do go into a fair bit of detail in the instructions on what this is supposed to be. I feel like giving them the test suite would make it maybe a little too easy. I do like to see if they've written tests. It's not mandatory for the, the thing we give them. A lot of people do, just because that's how they work. Uh, they typically write more like unit test stuff, which is great. I'd love to see that. Um, some people have written more kind of integration level tests. That's also great. Um, yeah, I just feel like it would maybe make it a little too easy. If, I, if it was a different sort of problem, I might. Um, but for this particular problem, I just feel like it would be too much help. Sure. Yes. Yeah, you, you kept mentioning that you should have a good idea and giving the, the candidate on, on what team they're going to work with uh, and, and details like that. What if you don't have that luxury? So that, that's if a great question. Booking.com, we are hiring a lot of, of, of people um, between making the offer and before they have accepted the offer and moved countries and start working. We are three to six months mm -hmm. forward, so we, have, we will have different teams. Yep. And at that time, we will see where they will go. How would you deal with that? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So the question was, what if you're in a situation where, you're, like Booking, where Abigail works at, where you're hiring a lot of people, it's a very big growing company. By the time somebody starts, it could be several months because it's a, often an international move. And by the time they start, the, the teams may have been reorganized or whatever. So they don't really hire for teams. So how do you accommodate that? Because I was talking about, well, the team should, you know, should decide on this based on the team. I think for that, you just, there's a couple things. One, you need to be a little more general in your evaluation criteria because you're looking probably for just people who are good that can be put somewhere. Uh, the other is you probably need to incorporate something into your interviews or screening where you try to get a better sense of their specific skills so that you can actually place them effectively. Uh, I've never worked at a company that's been big enough where that's been the case. I've always been hiring for more, you know, even when we were hiring more generally, it was like we had 10 developers and we were hiring the 11th. Um, we weren't necessarily looking for a super specific skill set, just a skilled developer we could bring in and throw at the, the things we were doing. But yeah, it's a, it's a different situation. So I think you just try to find ways to adjust it. You know, have more kind of conversational general questions and, and your job posting should probably be a lot much less specific and, and say that in the job posting, you know. At the rate we're hiring, you know, you probably will end up on a, a you know, we won't know your placement in advance. We're looking for skilled general developers who are, you know, can work in various areas, or if you have, you know, you probably say stuff like, if you have specific skills you think are of interest, let us know, because, you know, you might re be really happy to get a security expert to put on your security team, stuff like that. So, yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Victor. So, have you found any graceful way to get feedback from candidates? Oh, that's a great question. So, the question was, have we found any graceful way to get feedback from candidates? So, I was really excited to try this at Active State. So, I um, was like, okay, I'm gonna do this survey of everybody who got to submitting the homework or later in our, in our process, but didn't get the job. The people who we hired, I can ask them because they work for me. Um, of course, they might be inclined to say nice things at this point because they work for me, but at least I can have a longer conversation with them. So I'm like, great, I'm gonna send a survey, this is gonna be amazing. And I made it really simple. I had three questions. Did you feel that the hiring process was respectful? Yes or no? And then, what could we do better? No, it just had two questions. Okay, and then the third question was, it, we're going to enter you in a drawing for an Amazon gift card. Do you want it from the U.S. or Canada? Because that's where we were interviewing. Uh, out of like 20 people I sent it to, I got five responses. One of the people who said no, that the process wasn't respectful, gave us zero feedback. Um, the other feedback just was not as useful as I would have hoped. You know, one person... The people who were unhappy were unhappy for reasons I wasn't sure I could control. They were like, well, you know, I, you, you seem to assume one person was upset because they felt like we had assumed that like doing the homework and not live coding made it not stressful. But I was like, I never, I don't think I said that. I wouldn't assume it's not stressful, hopefully a little less stressful. 
Um, so I just wasn't sure. Like nobody gave me actionable, fe actionable feedback. Well, one person said they liked something we did, so we'll keep doing it. Uh, like when people asked, if we rejected them after the homework, if they asked for feedback, I would send them feedback. Kind of a sanitized version of our internal review. And one president said he liked that, so I was thinking in the future we should make that more formal. Put that in the, the email about the homework that, you know, if we are in the rejection, like if you'd like more feedback, let us know, because I'm happy to do that. It's the, it is literally, I feel like, the very least we can do. We've made you do this assignment. We can at least spend 10 minutes giving you some feedback on why we didn't like your code, right? Um, so I'll keep doing that, but I didn't get a lot of other actionable feedback. I was disappointed I only got five responses out of 20. It's like $50 Amazon gift card. Surely people will fill out a two-question survey for this. Um, and, and I made it clear that they could use like a, an anonymous mail address, like Mailinator or whatever. I wasn't trying to correlate it with people. Some people used the email address they submitted with. That's fine too, but I'm happy to send the gift card to Mailinator, but it wasn't that useful. So I don't know if I'd do it again. I mean, the company was like totally cool with me doing it. Um, again, one of the things I like about Active State, it's a pretty, pretty easy place to just try something out. Um, but yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't super useful. So I don't know if we can find other ways. One more comment and then I'm gonna stop. Was it related to that? Things that we did, they did at ZipRecruiter when I got hired is the HR person asked for feedback on the hiring process. Okay, so you're saying at ZipRecruiter they asked for feedback on the hiring process when you were hired? Um, it was between the coding sample, I guess there was multiple times, once after the coding sample and once after the in-person. Oh, that's interesting. So you were asked for feedback during the hiring process itself. Oh, that's interesting. I, I interviewed at ZipRecruiter and I don't remember them asking me that. I sent a long email unsolicited with feedback <laughs> that I then partially turned into this talk. Um, I, again, I really want to interview, emphasize, I really liked ZipRecruiter. Any, any like criticism I had should not be taken as like, oh, these are bad companies that I interviewed with. Just that I think it can be done better. So I, I do want to emphasize that since we mentioned one by name. Um, <laughs> cool place to work from everything I've heard. Uh, yeah, that's, I think that's an interesting idea, asking for feedback as you go. I, my only concern is I don't want people to feel pressured to provide good feedback. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really tough. It's, it's a great, great question because it's really hard. Like how can we Im improve this from the candidate's perspective when the vast majority of them don't get hired, right? Even the really good ones. If you have 10 good candidates in one position, you still only hire one. So it's, it's a tough problem. So. Glassdoor? Cloud? Glassdoor. Oh, Glassdoor. Um, yeah, I, I've looked at that like for ActiveState and other companies. For a small company like ActiveState, there's very little feedback. Uh, I'm sure for you know, bigger companies like ZipRecruiter or Booking, they probably have a decent amount of activity there. We're like 30 some people, so there's just not that much activity. Uh, and you, you know, I think for small companies, Glassdoor tends to get the outliers, the people love it or hate it. You just don't get enough feedback to get a really good sense. All right, I, I'm three minutes over. I will wrap it up, thanks again. And I hope you improve your hiring processes.